Father, we thank you that we can gather this morning in your name, that we can be your people in this place, and that we can come to worship you and to bow before you and to give you the praise and the glory that you deserve. And we thank you, Lord, for this Zoom uh, method that, so that we can be together even though we're apart. We thank you for your presence with us uh, all the time, uh, for your uh, faithfulness to uh, remind us of those that we need to pray for, that, uh, and Lord, that we would, when we remember uh, these people that are on the list, that you would um, have us stop and pause a moment and, um, and pray for these people who need our prayers, some of them very desperately. And Lord, we thank you that um, we can just come this morning and, and glorify you for all the things that you do for us each and every day that, that we unfortunately don't even think about, that we breathe, that we have air. And we thank you for the, the beauty of creation that we're beginning to see and, and the beauty of the sunshine. And Lord, we thank you each and every day for all the blessings that you um, give us, and most importantly, for life itself. We thank you most of all for Jesus, because he's the one who made it possible for us to come before you, and he's the one who made it possible for us to receive salvation and to know you, and, and Lord, we thank you that you sent your only beloved Son to be our Savior, and that you made this way of salvation, and that you prepared for it so long ahead of time, and that all the events of human history either point to Jesus, uh, either forward or backwards, depending on where we are. And we thank you, Lord, for him and for what he has done for us. We don't presume, Lord, to come into your presence um, because of any worth in ourselves, but only because of your grace and because of your righteousness uh, we thank you. So we, we lift up to you this morning all of these uh, people that we have mentioned on the prayer list, uh, many of whom are <clears throat> need um, significant healing. And Lord, we pray that as they are awaiting their healing, that they will rest in your presence, that they will know you, the one true God, that they will worship you and that their bodies will be at peace so that healing may happen. So we pray um, for their bodies, but we also pray for their spirits, uh, that they would be um, revived and rejuvenated. We thank you, Lord, for our church. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together uh, in freedom to worship you and to hear your word proclaimed to be encouraged and revived and strengthened uh, for the lives that you have for us to live. So, Lord, we, um, we give ourselves to you this morning. We present ourselves before you asking for your blessing because without you we can do nothing and asking that as we are blessed we might be a blessing. And we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus who is our all-sufficient one one who is Lord and Savior, who is empowerer, and who is um, our great high priest in heaven. Amen. Um, I'm sorry Tommy's not here today because she was the one who gave me a little track that she had received when she went out to wherever it is where the Noah's Ark. Uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania or somewhere up. Somewhere well, I thought it was in Kentucky. Yeah, I thought that's where it was. And then somebody said it was in Ohio. And now you're telling me it's in Well, it doesn't matter where it is. <laughs> but it's, it's somewhere. It's not right around here. And um, uh, she went there and thought it was a wonderful place to go. So we all need to find out where it is so we can go. Um, but she got a little pamphlet, a little track, I guess you'd call it. And it was about Jesus as the door. And so I thought, well, when we were doing this, if you recall in John, uh, we might turn there, John uh, 10, it talks about the door. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs in some other way, he is a thief and a robber. So he's talking about somebody who doesn't come in by the door. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. And then he goes on down and he says, um, verse 7, Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Then he goes on to talk about the thief. Um, so in that day, uh, if you were um, taking your uh, sheep from pasture to pasture, you might come up upon a place that had kind of a common uh, sheep pen. And the shepherd could put the sheep in there, and it was um, a circular type arrangement. And it would have a, a one opening, and the rest of it would be closed in. And so it, when night would come, the shepherd would sleep there in the door, in the entrance way, to keep the sheep in and the, and the wolves and whatever out. And so this is Jesus saying, and, and people on that day understood, because they were closer to this than we are, um, they understood what Jesus was saying, that he was the door. So um, that's what, what we're talking about, Jesus as the door of the sheep. And so I put the, started this lesson thinking it would be about a half of a lesson. And, and then I got into tying it into Jesus as the way, because, you know, when we think of a door, we can think of a door like this. But we also can mean like doorway, and that's, it means both things. It means doorway, which would be like an entrance. So you can think of the word entrance um, as, in, in, in the Hebrew, well, in Greek too, the, the word um, for door, um, here's a couple more people. The word really means entrance, so it can be the entrance to a lot of things. It's not. It could be the entrance to a cave, for example. Um, in in the case of Jesus's tomb, it was the entrance. It's the same word as being used, the entrance to the, the um, to the cave or to the tomb. Um, so I, I started on the and and then the, of course the word way, meaning path or road or street. Um, pathway uh, relates very well to the idea of an entrance. So that, that's where the idea for the lesson came from, and I think uh, Tommy's in the waiting room now. I'm trying to get her in. Okay. While yes, you're Tommy. working on that, Tommy. Maxine, I'm sorry. Uh, did you have any uh, report on Jackie, your cousin Jackie? Uh, yes, she she was out of surgery this morning at 2 a.m. And uh, she is, now the problem is to get her off of the ventilator and get her to breathe it by herself. Okay. Thank yes. you. Okay. So, Sorry. Tommy, I was just going into how I came about doing this lesson and how I thought that it was going to be um, a short you know, maybe half of a lesson because there wasn't too much material about it. But door meaning not just a door like 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 this wooden door, but the word also in the Hebrew and the Greek uh, means doorway or entrance, and so it can um, it can refer to the entrance way to a cave or the entrance way to the tomb of, of Christ or to a tomb or. Um, a lot of other, it can refer to a big entrance way like, um, like the entrance of a city gate, for example, um, would be, uh, and when we were with Richard on the uh, trip to Israel, we went to this place in Jordan called Jeresh, and it was a Roman um, uh, city. It was one of the Decapolis, you remember talking about the Decapolis in the New Testament? It was one of those cities. And or, or in that area where those cities were, and they had this enormous big gate of the city, you know, um, very um, thick. And you've probably seen pictures, kind of like the um, the Arch of Titus or one of those places if you've seen pictures of that in Rome. 
So um, I went with the idea of um, that Jesus is the pathway to life, um, and he is also, um, or that word in that sense, the way, the truth, and the life. Um, the way can mean the means, but it also means a pathway. And we, we know of all kinds of um, literature that thinks of life as a pathway. All kinds of books are, are on that type of theme, you know, that, it, that life is a journey. So, um, and Jesus is the entrance to, to real life. So I, I started looking and I, so I began by, and, and I've given you this whole thing and, and, and I had no idea this topic was going to have so much to it when I first started it to the point where we're going to have to spend two weeks on this lesson. <laughs> so because I, I, I don't want to go um, uh, too fast through this because there's a lot to understand. But we, we look in Genesis right at the very uh, beginning of um, the Bible, and as Adam and Eve are um, in the garden, and you remember, God uh, created Adam and Eve, and um, let's see, I'm looking up chapter 2, verse 7, and you know, right after it says that God formed the man from the ground and, beneath, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, and it says, and the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. God created the garden for man. It was right after he says he created man, he created the garden for man. And then in the next verse, it talks about that he put two trees in the center of the garden. You remember what were the two trees? The tree of life and the tree of people. Okay. And then eat. Oh. All right, the, the two trees in the middle, and he told uh, the man not to, to eat from those trees. And, of course, um, they did. And then uh, <laughs> anytime somebody says, well, don't do this, you're going to want to do it, right? And so um, then we have to go through all that. We're not going to go into all of that right now, but, but as a consequence of their sin and their disobedience, <laughs> they were, um, <laughs> we're not going to go into all that. Um, then um, in uh, chapter 3 verse 22 then the Lord God said behold the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil and now lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken and so he drove the man out and at the east of the garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and, it, and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. And so what he did was he had to um, remove the man and the woman from the Garden of Eden, this wonderful place that he had created specially for them. And it says that he had to do that because he didn't want them to eat from the tree of life. So what that means is it was really God's grace at work here because he did not, God did not want them in their sinful state to be able to live forever in their sinful state. He wanted to send his son so that he could redeem us so that when we do get to heaven, we're not, we don't live forever in this sinful state. That we can be redeemed in heaven. So it was, yeah, it was, it was um, like so many other things, it was a curse and a blessing at the same time. And so he drove them out, and it says that he stationed this cherubim where? At the entrance to the garden. And so he's, he's casting them out of the garden, and, um, and he places this cherubim there to keep them from going back at the entrance to the garden. And so that's the point that, that I'm making, is that, that after sin, um, God closed the garden. And we're going to see that the garden is restored in the book of Revelation. Uh, after two weeks, we're going to find that out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, going, it's going to take us a while to plow through but all this. But even though they but, had sinned, he did that to protect them from sinning again, right? He, well, he protected, protected them, from he protected them from living forever in a sinful state because right. he's going to send 
the Redeemer so that we don't have to live forever in a sinful state. We can live forever in his righteousness um, once we have been restored, redeemed and restored. Um, and so what you see here from the beginning is that um, um, the cherubim is there. It says to guard the way. There's the word way. We're going to be looking at way, and we're going to be looking at doorway, entrance, gate. It's translated in a number of different ways. Um, to keep man out of the garden. And think about it when... Um, Think about what the Garden of Eden was really like. It was not, y'all excuse me, I'm going to take my shoes off. Okay, my feet are going to okay. um, is that the Garden of Eden was a place where they had fellowship with God because remember, they walked with God in the cool of the evening. After dinner, they took a little stroll with the Lord and they looked at the creation and they just enjoyed one another's presence. You know, that's a nice thing to do in the cool of the evening, isn't it? Think about when we have these hot summers and we enjoy, and after it turns a little bit cooler, we enjoy the cool of the evening and enjoy a walk. I enjoy being on my porch in the cool of the evening better than walking, but anyway. The, the whole concept here is walking with God, and we see that in Genesis, we see some people who did walk with God. We see Enoch, and remember, he was taken uh, to heaven directly. Um, and we see Noah. It says that Noah, even though Noah was not a perfect man, he uh, walked with God. So <coughs> the, um, the entrance was blocked to the Garden of Eden, not to be restored until Christ came. Um, and so what does an entranceway do? What does, going back to the sheep in the, in the sheep pen and the shepherd as the entranceway to the sheep pen, um, it, the, the entrance is designed to let people come in and go out, but it's a control um, mechanism so that to keep the good things in in a safe place and to keep the bad things out. And those people who come over the wall, who don't come in by the entrance, remember, they're the thieves and the robbers. So um, that's what we're going to find as we go through. We're going to look at Noah next, if you turn over to Genesis 6. And just as an aside, you know, there, there are really only two chapters devoted to, um, uh, to the creation of the world in the Bible, I mean, in Genesis. But look at how many chapters are devoted to the flood. The flood was a big deal. Um, God thought it was a big deal. It was judgment of sin. And so why did God destroy the creatures on earth except those ones that were in the ark? Sin. Okay. And if you will notice the, the repeated words just in this little section of chapter 6, you will notice that wickedness, and evil, that's the same word in verse 5. It says that wickedness of man was great and that only evil continually. Same word. Um, um, that, and that they were corrupt in verse 12. Two times there. Violence in verses 11 and 13. Um, you know, the Lord does not like violence. And it's very distressing to see how much violence we have today in our culture. Um, something that, that I don't believe we've had like this um, in our culture before, the extent that it is. But these, these are the repeated words. And then it says here in verse 9, But Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. So how do you get to be righteous and blameless. It, and my contention is, it's with walking with God. Those who walk with God become like Him. Have you ever noticed that? You know, when two people walk together, um, you know, it's, it's hard if one person has a, long, a lot longer stride than the other one does. Right? Because somebody's always running to catch up or somebody's always slowing down to wait on somebody else. But when two people walk together and, and they get their pace in sync, 
um, they, they have um, a familiarity with one another and uh, they become like one another. And so Noah, it says, walked with God. And that doesn't mean he was perfect, but he was considered righteous before God because he walked with God. Uh, so he was different from the other people. Now, what was the, he, God instructed him to build an ark, which most people think this was before there was any rain. And so and people would think he was crazy for building this enormous thing in his backyard anyway. But then if it, if it had never rained, they would think he was even crazier. Um, so what was the purpose of the ark? Okay, Sharon said it was for a remnant, to preserve God's remnant, to preserve those who were um, righteous, who were in relationship with him. Um, and God made for a window, so eventually they could see out and see when it had quit raining and, and see that the skies were turning blue and they could send the dove out. And he also con had him construct uh, a door in it so they could come in. And, and I ask you the question, how did the animals get in the ark? And what did you put for that? They actually came yeah. to the ark. They came to the ark. God brought the ones that he wanted to come to the ark. Um, and where does it say that? Um, um, 20. Verse 20. Verse 20. And of the birds after their kind and the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind. Notice that use of the word kind because that shows us that, um, um, you know, you can have a few representative ones and a lot of different species can come out of those few. Um, it's verse 16. Yeah. Of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. They shall come to you to keep them alive. So they did not have, Noah didn't have to go and round up these animals. And um, does somebody have uh, two devices going on at the same time? That's what can cause feedback like that. Um, so Noah didn't have to go around and catch them. They came to the ark. They were willing to go in. He didn't have to drag them in. Okay. Um, so we see that the, the uh, ark was there to preserve life. And who closed the door of the ark? The Lord. The Lord closed the door. And um, so there was a door to the ark, and the door was through God and his provision. And the door was to enter a place of safety and protection where life could be preserved, just like the sheep and the sheep pen. What's going on here? Is it that? Okay. So we're beginning to see a pattern here of a, um, something to protect people who are on the inside and to keep out people who are on the outside. And the door is the way in between. And the door into the ark was closed by the Lord. Now we go on to Abraham in uh, Genesis 15. I have a trivial question, but when we were talking about this uh, as a family the other night, the kids were wondering how they were able to fit two of every kind of animal as well as the animals that they needed to offer as sacrifices at the end all on this, I mean, it was a ginormous ship that I told them, but, I mean, realistically, it's hard for me to explain to them how that can happen, because you have animals that want to kill other animals. Well, they, they didn't want to kill each other yet. They were not, um, they were not carnivores yet, and they became carnivores after the flood. Remember, man was allowed to eat the animals after the flood? Right, so they're thinking that, that they were they were not there were no carnivores then, and that goes back. So even to, the animals weren't, even though they imply that the animals were corrupt as well, because God abolished the ones that weren't on the ship. Yeah, yeah. So they um, didn't eat each other before the flood. I, that's what a lot of people think, 
And it goes back to this thing. It's, if you look through this whole account, um, some, somebody has got a cell phone next to their computer. That's uh, no, what causes no. it. I turned off my phone just, just in case, but that didn't okay. help it. So okay. I just checked too, and I don't have any. Okay. Um, all through here, you'll see that it says, of the birds of after their kind, it talks about kinds a lot. And people who study this look at that and say, for example, um, you could have one species and all the wolves and the dogs of all different kinds. You know how, you know, it used to be you only had about three kinds of dogs that you have, and now there's just all these different species of dogs because we've bred them in that way. But all the wolves and everything could have come from one pair of animals. Uh, and other animals like that, a, a lot of diversity um, to be in the genes of the particular ones. And when it says that God caused the animals to come to the ark, he brought the ones that had the right genes so that the combinations could um, be developed uh, afterwards. So I don't think it was, it wasn't as many animals as we have around here today um, because there would only, there would only be one pair of, of something that could create dogs and wolves and coyotes and all the things that are in that particular class of animals. Um, so that would have made it fewer animals. But there were, there were seven of the animals that were, um, the sacrificial animals, and then two of the ones that were um, ordinary animals. Um, Nancy? Yes, Tommy. I highly recommend, if you haven't been to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, you actually see how big the Ark is and how they could have cages and little places for the little animals and how they fed them and got the waste away. It, it is, and how they had um, airflow going through. It's not factual, but it all could have been the way it is. And it was, it was a, a thrilling thing. I think any, any kids would just love it. Sounds Grown like a road there. trip to me. What is it called, Tommy? The Ark Encounter. Okay. Thank and you. it's in northern Kentucky, not far from Cincinnati, which is another. We did this in a week last fall and just had a really good time. There's also a creation museum up there, um, and they're they're planted with um, gardens that look like the beginning of time, and uh, it shows how dinosaurs were on the ark, and how they had the small ones, and they were in cages, so they didn't they they were controlled, and it it's it's just fascinating the way they thought through all the details. Thank you, thank you, and that's where the. Um, Really, the, the idea of this lesson came from is from Tommy's little pamphlet. It's in Williamstown, Kentucky. Okay, I'm sure you can look it up, the Ark in Kentucky. Um, okay, so we're moving on to Abraham now. I know that this lesson was going to take a long time to get through. Uh, and we see here um, in Genesis 15... Um, over in uh, where I'm getting my word from that I'm following through here uh, is in um, is in uh, chapter 18 verse 19 for I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way, the word is way, the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Now remember righteousness and blamelessness were associated with Noah. Doing righteousness and justice in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. So it's talking about uh, doing or doing righteousness and justice and doing the way of the Lord. 
So, um, what did Abraham do to make the covenant with the Lord in chapter 15? Offered a sacrifice? Well, he got it all ready. He went out and okay. got the birds and he cut them and he placed them just like the Lord said. And then the Lord put him to sleep. So it's a little bit of a trick question. He prepared what was necessary for the sacrifice. Oh, and he then, prepared. Yeah, okay. he prepared it. He got it all ready. Um, but then he was asleep and God performed both sides of the covenant. Remember the smoking torch and the flaming, the, the smoking oven and the flaming torch actually went through the pieces and made the promises one to another because God knew that Abraham could not keep his promise. And so God made the divine part of the, the covenant, the divine promises, and God made the human. And so I think this is a picture of God the Father and God the Son, of, of God and Jesus making the covenant here in, in the presence, uh, I mean, in the uh, form of the smoking oven, that's in verse 17, the smoking oven and the flaming torch. Because God knew that Abraham couldn't keep it. And we, and we saw how Abraham couldn't keep it. He did a lot of things that were, um, that were not right. And, um, but the Lord considered him righteous and blameless. Just like Noah. Remember, Noah was righteous and blameless. And we look and we see in... Well, I put 15.5, but it's really 15. It's really 15.6. That's the typo. Um, then, and this is very famous. Paul uses it in the New Testament. Then he believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, reckoned it to him as righteousness. Abraham was walking with God. And because he walked with God, and he believed God, the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. So in, in God's eyes, Abraham was righteous and blameless. Same thing is true for us. If we are his and we um, um, are walking with him in his way, then um, if we believe, then he considers us righteous and blameless. Um, Nancy, I have it marked in my Bible that this is the first time righteousness was mentioned. Is that no? Um, it's probably the first time believe is mentioned because we we just saw that righteousness mentioned uh, with Noah uh, in Genesis. Let's look at that. Oh, okay. Well, I don't I don't know why I have that, but I just wanted to ask about it. Um, let me see if I let me look back just quickly. Oh, in verse uh, chapter six nine, it says Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Yeah, I see that. Okay. So, well, I'm glad I got that. Ask that. So the thing is that we know from looking at Abraham's life that he was not um, without sin. But God reckoned it. And the, the um, reformers in the Reformation made a big point of this. It's not that we are, we're not claiming that we are without sin. We are claiming that God reckons it to us. He puts it on our account. He takes what was Christ and he gives it to us because he took what was ours and he put it on Christ. It's an exchange. And so it's a reckoning. It's not that, um, that we are without sin. It's that he looks at us as if we're without sin. Or to put it another way, he looks at us with Christ-colored glasses. You know, you might talk about rose-colored glasses, but he looks at us through the lens of Christ to see us as his. So that's a very important part. 
point. So he is asking um, uh, Abraham in verse 17, um, he is telling Abraham, he says, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. That's what he says to Abraham. And so how do we walk before him? What way do we walk in uh, in order to be uh, blameless before him? And it's at that point that the covenant is is um, is made. And Well, the covenant has already been made, but at that point, God gives him the sign of the covenant, which, of course, is circumcision. Incidentally, there are two signs of the covenant, one of which is circumcision, and, um, um, and the other is Sabbath. Two signs of the covenant. God still considers the Sabbath important, by the way. Okay. So, Abraham is one who is walking in the way of the Lord as one who is righteous and blameless, not because of his own self-effort, but because of his belief. He believed God. And in the New Testament, that phrase uh, from uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, is very important um, in, in Paul and in the other New Testament writers. Okay, so that is the way that he is walking. And, you know, Abraham traveled, he walked the way up and down that land um, as the Lord's companion because he believed in the Lord and he was there walking and doing what the Lord told him to do. Okay, so then we come to Lot in chapter 19. Are you all on the Zoom able to to hear what I'm saying okay, or is this noise bothering you all? You keep breathing in and out. Yeah. I miss half, I miss half of what you're saying. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, well, I wonder if you muted everybody, if it would help the situation. Mom. Yeah, why, why don't, um, well, let me see. Almost everybody has muted. Yeah. You, oh, okay, I'm going to mute you, girls. Okay. Okay, let's see if that helps, okay? And when I ask you a question, you can go, you know, shake your head one way or the other. Okay. So now, okay, that has helped. So now we are a lot. And um, I, th I found this really interesting. I, I, I looked up the word door is what I did first in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I looked up the word door. Then I had to look up some more words because I had to look up gate and a lot of different ones. But a lot of those words are the same Greek word or Hebrew word, depending on whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament. But um, here in Lot, you remember the, the uh, angels come to visit Lot and they talk to him and then the neighbors come, the wicked and violent and awful neighbors come and they beat on the door here's the door and so what you have is you have the angels are keeping the people inside the house who are inside the door keeping them safe it's like an ark it's like a safe place and the door and remember light goes out to speak to them and they just about do him in, and so the angel reaches out and jerks Lot back in and slams the door shut. And so it's like the angels are there to pre to preserve life in the midst of wickedness. Same concept, imagery, as we have in the flood with Noah. And so the men were on the outside, and it's, it's real interesting um, because a lot at best, seems to be reluctant in his faith. And he goes on a, a little ways, and, you know, and, and he he's not sure he wants to go, and then, then his wife looks back, and then you know, he says, oh, well, I can't go up to the mountains, which is where they wanted to go, and he settles in some town, and, and uh, he, he doesn't really want to go all the way with the angels to what, with what they say. They, they're, they're having to drag him along if you notice. Now, 
Um, Nancy, too. I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm taking, I'm going back to the Garden of Eden, too. The angel was the one that kept the good in and the bad out. Um, right. Set the, set the standard right there. Right. Because all the, the garden was the good, but man had sinned, so he was out. That's right. And so, and so there's only one way in. You know, like into Lot's house, there was only one way in, and the angel was there to keep those bad people out. Um, but, you know, here's Lot, and he's surrounded by all this wickedness, and yet in Second Peter, um, he refers to righteous Lot. You know? Now, he is righteous because however limited and faltering and puny his faith was, he had a little faith, and God looks at him through the eyes of Je with the eyes of Jesus, and he sees righteous Lot. Um, well, he's willing to give up his own daughters yeah. to the neighbors. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> uh, so, the, so why did the two angels come to visit? They came to, to preserve Lot. Yeah. And remember, Abraham had been through this big conversation with God beforehand as he looked down and said, oh, if there's only... So, you know, God saved the, the righteous, um, even though Lot was very reluctant and a lot of his family wouldn't go along with him and he lived in all of this wickedness. Um, and he, his soul was tormented by all the wickedness around him, but God saved him and his little uh, family. So Lot's house, so I, I sort of answered the question for you, how is it like the ark? It's a place of uh, protection that the angels are protecting the way in and the way out. <clears throat> okay, so um, the next thing I wanted to look at is uh, one of my favorite subjects, of course, the tabernacle. And... Um, you know, like I said before, two basically two chapters in Genesis to um, the creation account, uh, a number of chapters in Genesis to the flood, but then a lot of chapters devoted to the tabernacle, what went on in the tabernacle, such as the sacrifices and, and so forth. Um, many, many chapters are devoted to those things. And so I, I wanted to... Um, the meaning of every little piece. Every little thing has a meaning. And we're, we're just focusing on one part of it, and that is the door. And uh, let me just say this, that when we read in our English Bibles and we read the translations, it's very confusing because there were, um, there were two doors. Uh, there was... Um, well, let me just say... You remember there was a courtyard. There was the, in the middle was uh, the tabernacle proper, which, and I want you to put on your, um, your, put your imagination on and really visualize this in your brain because it's very profound. But the the the, the structure in the middle had the holy place, which is where the priests could go, and then it had the holy of holies, which was the presence of God. And it was gorgeous on the inside. I mean, the furniture was all overlaid with gold. Um, the hangings on the wall were this blue and red and purple fabric with embroidery all over it of angels and golden thread in the fabric. And that was all on the inside. But then it was covered over with a number of different um, um, layers of... Um, tinting material laid over the top of it, the, the last layer of which was a badger skin. So it was just uh, dark brown, ugly from the outside. But on the inside was all of this gorgeous, magnificent beauty. And, and when they took the, everything apart so that, it, that this uh, thing, this was not built as a permanent structure, it was built to travel with them. 
Um, and, you know, I think God used that imagery so that we could see that God is with us wherever we go. But anyway, and he was with them wherever they went on their journeys. Um, but uh, from the outside, it just looked like nothing. It just looked like something had this dark brown coating over the top of it. And yet inside was all this wonderful stuff, which people, most of the people couldn't see. Because only... One priest went in there twice a day to go in the outermost part where the beauty was. So, and then around that brown uh, um, thing covered with the, the, the badger skins, and, and that would be water protective um, over it. Uh, not that it rained that much, but they would have some. And so around it was this large courtyard, and it was surrounded by... Um, it had um, poles and rods that connected the poles and then they had hangings from those and those hangings were uh, five cubits high which is about eight feet high okay on the outside now this thing in the middle the poles of it were um, uh, ten cubits high which would be about fifteen feet so it was real tall and smaller in um, surface area, but the volume of it was there. Okay, so I want you to get this picture of this brown tent thing in the middle, and then surrounded by this big courtyard. It was it was big. It was um, fifty by one hundred cubits. So fifty would be seventy five feet by one hundred and fifty feet. So that's pretty big. White curtains all around. And then beyond that were the tents of the children of Israel. It uh, camped according to their tribes, very orderly. So when they came to a place in their travels and God said, here it is, this is the place for the tabernacle, the tabernacle, the door always faced to the east. Now, whenever you see pictures of the tabernacle, somebody's drawing the tabernacle, and they draw the, um, the door of the tabernacle on the west, then you get up and leave because they don't know anything about what they're talking about. It was to the east, okay? And so they would orient the tabernacle towards the rising of the sun, and, uh, and then everybody knew where they were supposed to camp in relation to where the tabernacle was. They knew where east was, the sun, and everybody knew these people camped on this side, these people camped on that side, and they, they didn't just, whoever got there first got the best place. It was very orderly. They knew where they belonged and where, where they were supposed to set up their tent. It was very orderly. And so, but the, all of their tents were this dark color, like the, like the badger skins. And so in the midst of this camp with all these tents out there, dark brown tents, and then here's this white, these white curtains in the midst of all these dark uh, brown tents. And then in the middle of the, of the, insert, of the courtyard was the, the uh, tabernacle proper. Okay. So, um, let's look at this. What was the purpose of the tabernacle? For God to dwell among his people. Now, you know, that is an astounding thing. Here's a God who is holy and righteous, and he wants to dwell among these people who are obstinate, who want to do it their own way. They want to break all the rules. They are an ungrateful uh, people. Um, they balk at everything God tries to set up for blessing. They balk at it. Does that sound like anybody you know? Nice. Sounds like me, doesn't it? Sounds like you. Okay. So, the, But the purpose was that God... Holy and majestic and righteous would come and dwell in the midst of these people, of us people, that God would come and dwell in the midst. I mean, 
I think it is an astounding thought that God gives us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. I think God has taken a big risk <clears throat> because we're not going to give good glory to him. Like, but like, how great like is for us? Oh, yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah, it's great. Okay, so what he came to dwell in their midst, and the encampment was all around this um, tabernacle area. And so the tabernacle was the center, just as God was the center of their, of their encampment of who they were as a people. God was the center. But he was at a distance. And so the holiness, God had to be inside and had to be away from the people. He was with them, but he was not with them. He was in their midst, but at a distance because his holiness uh, could not abide their sinfulness. And so the only way of limited, limited approach to him was through the sacrifices that were offered in this tent so that people might have some limited access unto God. And, and the limitation was that, that one priest twice a day went into the holy place and offered prayers of incense and um, uh, put oil in the uh, oil lamps and trimmed the wicks. And then once a week they would exchange out the bread that was on the table that represented the people because there were 12 up for 12 tribes. And so this was very limited. And then it was only one day a year that the high priest dressed in his elegant robes, which he blended right in with the inside of the tabernacle. And so, yeah, that once a year when they saw him outside the tabernacle putting on this wonderful uh, robes, once a year they got a glimpse of what it was like to be in the presence of God. Think about Jesus. We get a glimpse of what heaven is like of what it's like to be in the presence of the Lord all the time. We get a little glimpse by looking at Jesus because this great high priest, this high priest they had would fit right in to, you know, he, he, the colors of his uh, and, and the materials and everything was exactly like what the inside of the tabernacle was like. So they, they got to see just a tiny glimpse of what uh, the inside was like, what fellowship with God was like. So, um, so let's talk about those materials. The materials uh, for the white linen around the, they call them the curtains, the white linen curtains. And keep in mind, they were eight feet tall, so they were t taller than people. Somebody couldn't come up to the outside and really look in and see. Um, it was made of fine, twisted linen. And you know, um, even today, if you want to buy the finest sheets, you would buy Egyptian cotton uh, sheet uh, for your sheets. And so it was very finely, uh, fine twisted linen was what it was woven of. And it was white, they were white. And then the doorway into this uh, courtyard with the um, white linen curtains the doorway is made of this blue and purple and red fabric. The doorway. Now think of it, how shocking that would be. You've got white all around, and then in the middle you've got this black um, structure uh, covered over. And then these absolutely beautiful um, curtains which form the doorway into this courtyard. Now, they, um, in, in my Bible, they switch back and forth talking about the curtains and the, uh, 
and the screen and the door and everything. The, the same word is translated different things. I've been back and looked at it, and I thought, well, why do they do they translate all different to you? You cannot go by the English. But um, here was this, what I'm going to call the screen of the gate. And, and it was, I ask you to look at the dimensions of it. It was, um, let me just give you this, because, and this is very tedious, but I hope you'll follow me on this. The entrance to the courtyard, okay, the white, uh, around, uh, is a part of the white curtains. The entranceway was five cubits high by 20 cubits, um, that was the size of the door, this way, okay? So that is 100 square cubits, the doorway, the entranceway. Now, if you go into the tabernacle proper, there was a doorway to get in there. And it, it was taller and narrower. So it was 10 cubits high, because remember I told you that inside part was 10 cubits high. It was 10 cubits high, but the doorway was only 10 cubits wide, which is like 15 feet. Okay, that's pretty wide. But still, so it, it was 100 square cubits. Understand? Multiply 10 by 10, and you get 100. So you have 5 by 20, and then you have 10 by 10. Now, the interesting thing about that is this outer uh, screen to the outer courtyard was wider, more accessible for people to get in. Of course, they had to bring the animals in through that. And if you ever see a picture and it's all drawn back and everything, that's not right. But they were down, and they had to move them back in order for, to get things in and out. Um, they had to get the animals in. But... It was, a, it was a wide door. It was accessible, uh, easily accessible. Now, the doorway into the tabernacle proper is small in width. And there are not as many people come into that. Just the priests. Now, as Christians, we're all considered priests. We don't have priests anymore. It's called the priesthood of all believers. The Reformation was... Um, big on that. We're all priests, so we all get to enter into the tabernacle, but the door is narrower. It's deeper. It's deeper. It's, it's, it's ten cubits high. It's deeper. Because those who come into fellowship in there, it's a deeper relationship, but it's wider out there to allow any who want to come in. It's easy to come in. It's not locked. It's easy to come in. It's a wide door. And think about this. So, so it's a wide door. It's very accessible. But there was only one gate. There was only one way in. It, remember Jesus said about the sheep pen, the ones who jump over the fence, they're the robbers and the thieves. You couldn't jump over this eight-foot-tall uh, uh, barrier. It's a barrier around, the white barrier. But it's a wide gate, and it's an only gate, just like the only way in for us is, is Jesus, is through Jesus. Um, and, and it's an accessible gate. It's easy uh, to move, but the fabric was strong. And so it, you had to, had to move it in order to get through. And the thing I like about it is, what is it made out of? It's made out of not the white, it's made out of the blue and the red and the purple. And so out of all of this, the gate, the entranceway, is gorgeous. It's not down, dead. It's just beautiful. And so the people got to see that the entranceway to the presence of God is a beautiful, beautiful place. It's attractive. It's the most beautiful thing they have ever seen. And they were a part of making it. And they gave gifts to make it. And then one of the writers that I read said it was a well-supported gate. It had four pillars that kept it so that that veil wasn't going to fall down. You know, it was strong in there. And they likened that to the four Gospels. Um, it's a strong 
thing. I don't know. I, you can get into numerology. I'm not too big into that. But. So here was the, um, I think, the size, the fact that it was a wide gate, and then as you move on from that courtyard, which is where the sacrifice takes place, into the, the tabernacle itself, it's a deeper, um, more intimate fellowship with God there. But the, the entrance way through Jesus is wide. And its fabric is uh, the type, it's a fine linen, and that it speaks to the sinlessness. And the purpose of it is to show a definite line of demarcation. There's a definite place where you go in. You know where it is. You know if you're in or if you're out. It's not just some nebulous area that you walk through and you don't know where the line is. You're either in or you're, or you're out. And it's, it's a way of approach to the holy place of God. I just thought that was magnificent to me, to, to, to realize that the people did get a glimpse, both in when they saw the high priest getting into his garments once a year for the Day of Atonement, which was the one day he could go in to the, to the holiest place and take the sacrifice for the people for the year. Um, and uh, this gorgeous, gorgeous um, uh, screen, that some writers call it the screen that goes across the, the outer courtyard part. Now think about... Nancy, um, okay, yeah. is this veil and door that you're talking about? Is that the, that's the one that's 10 by 10, right? And then the sure outer, that, that, was, that was like a symbol of square and perfection also? Well, the, um, the outer courtyard, I must call that the screen, okay, okay. and not the door. The screen was um, five cubits by 20. By 20. Right. The, the, the inner one was, that 10 went, by 10. Is that right? was the, the door of it was 10 by 10. Um, and that's supposedly it's a perfection, is what? Um, well, when the Holy of Holies was a cube. And it was 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet. Okay. okay. The width across was 10 feet. So when you get into the, 10 by 10 feet. Into the, um, the, the structure proper on the inside of the courtyard, it is uh, 10 by 30, actually, in total. 10 by 10 of it is the Holy of Holies, and 10 by 20 is the outer place called the Holy Place. There's the Holy Place and then the Holy of Holies. Actually, that place is in the Hebrew, if you look at the words, and I don't know Hebrew, but I can look at how the words are. It's the Holy Holy. It's the word holy twice. The Holy Holy is what we call the Holy of Holies. And then the Holy Place is where the, the priests went um, daily, twice, to do their thing. But the width of that, so the door, was a, the door to that part was across the whole width of that structure. I'm making sense to you? Okay. So, um, I, I thought that was kind of neat about the doors, that the door's wide, and then um, not everybody who comes to uh, into Jesus wants to go on deeper and deeper and deeper. There's more to it. Now, what I want you to see is at the, right there at the door to the courtyard, okay, the white tents, right inside there was where the altar of sacrifice was. It was just right inside the door or the screen. And that's where the people would come and bring their animals for sacrifice. You know, they would lay their hand on the top of the animal and they, they would slay the animal and then the priest would um, burn the parts and, and do all the things that he was supposed to do with the sacrifices there and different things for different sacrifices you know we went through that earlier that Jesus is the sacrifice you know he's, he fulfills everything in the tabernacle including the door or the screen uh, but what I wanted you to see was at the door of the tabernacle uh, is where this altar was and so uh, the people would come to this screen and think of it as just beautiful. It's this gorgeous blue and red and purple and gold threads. And, and they would get a glimpse of the glory of God there by looking at that, at that hanging. And then they would come in and they would offer their sacrifice and they knew that, that the sacrifice was 
their means of approach to God. And that was as close as they could get. But what I wanted you to see was <clears throat> all the things that happened at the door of the of the tabernacle, this doorway of the of the um, of the whole of the outer courtyard. <clears throat> and this and I've, I've given you those references. We won't look them all up, but you'll see that all those different offerings, the burnt offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, all the animal sacrifice offerings were initiated right there at the doorway. The people would come to this screen, this gorgeous uh, screen surrounded by the white walls. And um, and that's where they would offer their offering. And then every, every day, they had what they called the continual um, burnt offering. You know, they had to offer up a burnt offering just because it was a new day. And that's just because we, we all sin. There wasn't a particular occasion in mind. It was just that we are a sinful people and we need to make an offering uh, in morning and in evening. And um, we went through that. Uh, I think I gave you all a sheet and it had uh, all the basic offerings that should have been done. It was just a, a whole lot of offerings if they had really done it like they were supposed to have done it. I don't think they did. But... Um, um, so th this was a continual thing that was going on. There was always smoke going up from the altar, and there was always that um, smell going up. Um, there were always offerings, or there should have been, offerings being offered, and it was done right there at the doorway of the, um, of the tabernacle, of the courtyard. <clears throat> and then we see a number of various events that um, that happen there. When, um, and I gave you uh, in Leviticus 10 about uh, the death of Aaron's two sons. You remember they offered strange fire. We're not sure exactly what that means, but they did something that was contrary to what God had said about the offerings. And um, God had Nadab and Abihu, two of Aaron's sons, killed because they had done this thing that was um, contrary to what God had said, it was disrespecting uh, what God had said. And uh, Aaron was not allowed to leave the tabernacle for, I think it was seven days after that. He was not allowed to go to the funeral of his sons uh, because he had the holy oil on him and he was required to stay inside the tabernacle area for that time, and the Lord told him not to go out of, of the tabernacle. So there were there were um, restrictions because of God's holiness and because of the holiness of the priests for certain activities in the um, in the tabernacle, and the people would gather at the doorway, and they would see what was happening, and this, this was a witness to them to know what was going on. And so the tabernacle, because it was in the center, was the place where the people would gather at the doorway. And so a lot of the, um, if you look at it from the people's point of view of what they actually experienced, not what the priests experienced on the inside, but the cleansing of the leper was done at the doorway, uh, and actually, we call it the, the law of the cleansing of the leper, but what it really was was um, the leper had to already be clean, uh, cleansed, healed of the leprosy, and then he came and he offered a sacrifice in order to enter back into the encampment of the children of Israel. Um, and so that was done right there at the doorway. Um, and there was always this... <coughs> thought that the sin of the people would defile the tabernacle. And so the, the people were encouraged not to do certain things because if they did those things, whatever was sinful, then it would defile the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God. Um, I gave you a number six, the Nazarite vow. When somebody made a Nazarite vow, and you remember Samson was a Nazarite, a lot of people think maybe John the Baptist was. Um, 
they had, um, we can look at that in number six, uh, they had to, um, they couldn't drink any wine uh, for the period of their vow. They would take this vow for a certain period of time. Um, no razor to their um, beard. And they couldn't be around a dead person or a dead animal, anything dead. And so um, it, when the time was um, at the end of their vow, if they'd made a vow for a certain length of time, at the end they would come and they would make a sacrifice, and then that was when they could um, cut their hair again. Um, they would do that at the doorway to the tent of meeting. And then in Numbers 10 it talks about the two silver trumpets they had. And think about it, they didn't have... Uh, sirens and, and um, they didn't have text messaging and all that back then. And so if there was a reason for the people to need to come together, they had certain um, ways they would blow the horns. I guess uh, I'm just thinking sort of like Morse code or something like that. You know, if you blew it this way, that meant you ought to come. If you blew it that way, danger, there's a ta somebody's attacking us. If you blew it another way, uh, it meant different things. So you blow it uh, when they were on the Sabbath. Um, and and the congregation would then come and gather at the doorway of the tent. So it was like the center of town, so to speak. Um, when uh, Miriam and um, Aaron speak against Moses, and I've got that, uh, I think I've got the wrong verse there. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm circled that because it was interesting. Um, you know, Miriam and Aaron thought Moses had overstepped his bounds, uh, and so they, they wanted uh, to lead. And then it says, Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron, uh, Aaron and Miriam. And then he... Uh, told them that he had chosen Moses. Um, in the, during the time when um, of Korah's rebellion, when the people were um, once again rebelling against the leadership of, of Aaron this time and the, and the uh, Levites, um, um, you remember God said, okay, everybody, every um, tribe's going to present a um, a sensor, and we'll see whose sensor uh, is still working. And uh, they had to put them at the doorway of the tent of meeting. All this stuff took place at the doorway, and at the doorway was where the people could see. Average person, this is what they saw. They didn't see what went on. It's not like us when we go to church, and I mean, even in the Catholic church, they can look down there and they at least see what the priest is doing. In our church, you know, we're invited to come in and we we come to the table of the Lord and we can see as Richard is preparing the elements for us for communion. Uh, we, we, we can see that. They couldn't see all that going on in there, but they could come to the doorway. And this was where uh, Aaron, it said that Aaron, um, if you recall, after the um, Korah's rebellion and they had the censors and then the earthquake came and it, uh, they went into the bottom of the, uh, the earth split and the, all the rebellious people fell in there. And then uh, a plague broke out because the people complained. Um, if you look in Numbers 16, beginning in 41. Um, but on the next day, the next day after this happened, you'd think they would have been scared to death to complain or anything after the earth had come and opened up and all these people had fallen in. But on the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, You are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. Um, but it happened um, about, it came about, however, when the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and there it was, the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them instantly. And then, of course, um, Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer, remember the censer they had put in the fire, and put it in the fire from the altar, and lay incense on it, 
and then bring it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone forth from the Lord, the plague has begun. And so this plague happened. Then Aaron took it as Moses had spoken and ran into the midst of the assembly. For behold, the plague had begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And this is the, ver the verse that you need to underline. And he took his stand between the dead and the living, so that the plague was checked. He took his stand. And you know, God calls, Jesus took his stand between the living and the dead for us, but we need to take our stand between the living and the dead as well in his strength. And then it says, uh, so that the plague was checked, but those who died by the plague were 14,700, besides those who died on account of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the doorway of the tent of meeting, for the plague had been checked. So this was a place where all the people would come, not only to offer their sacrifices, but they came there when various big events were happening, and when they could see what was going on. And it was this, like the center of town, so to speak. Then we see that in us, uh, any questions about that? I want to go ahead and finish up the Old Testament because we're almost there. But we see that um, uh, in the, after the time of David, Solomon built the, the temple, which is really modeled after the um, tabernacle. It's just bigger and more. It's bigger uh, and, it's, and it's, um, bigger and it's more and it's permanent. It's in one place. It doesn't move. Um, it was made with stones, uh, big uh, quarried stones. They quarried it, everything so that it would fit and then moved it into place so that there was no hammering or chiseling or anything going on during the construction at the site. It was all done elsewhere and brought in. Monumental uh, feat to do. Um, the walls on the inside, there was no stone showing on the inside. It was all covered with a cypress and cedar, and um, the the um, cypress and cedar, and, and then th those places on the inside of the uh, temple proper were covered with gold. Um, it was um, a, a sight to behold, I'm sure. the The wood was carved, you know, just like in the the tabernacle. The um, Curtains on the inside of the inner part of the tabernacle had um, cherubim and other things um, uh, woven into the fabric or embroidered on the fabric. And the, um, like for example, the um, the uh, lamp stands were um, um, molded, uh, that it was not molded, it was beaten. They don't know how they made it because it was beaten and it had little blossoms and fruit and of the olive um, on there uh, as, a, as a part of, you know, we had decorative things like that when we have a candlestick or something, it might have fruit around it or something. But it was very beautiful. Um, but instead of just one uh, lampstand, they had ten, because it was a big area, and they needed more light in there. And then, um, so it was just, it was bigger and more. But it was modeled after the, um, the pattern of the tabernacle. Um, so then they had the doors, what they call the doors of the inner sanctuary, which were of olive wood, and then the doors of the nave, I guess, which would... Um, uh, correspond to um, what we're talking about with the screen was there was carved of cypress wood and that was it was carved in there it was, I'm sure it was beautiful um, what we notice is that um, during the um, when Assyria came down and attacked the northern kingdom um, and took those people off into slavery then, he, then the king of Syria came down and, and put siege on Jerusalem. And that was during the time of King Hezekiah. And um, God preserved the, the southern kingdom from Assyria. But um, it says that um, in, in 2 Kings uh, 18 that Assyria took off some of the gold. 
and turn to that Second Kings 18 from the doors. Uh, and at that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overled and gave it to the king of Assyria. So some of the gold from the temple was taken away at, at that time to Assyria. And then I just wanted you to see that um, there were, in Chronicles, and you know Chronicles tells the same story that Kings tells, but it's from a more spiritual point of view. And so Ahaz was a terrible king. Um, in Second Chronicles 28, he was 20 year, years old, and all of them start the same way. It tells you how old they were when they became a king and how many years they were a king and who their mother was. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do right in the sight of the Lord as David his father had done. Not meaning that David was literally his father, meaning he was his, in the line of David. Um, the kings of the southern kingdom were still in the line of David. The kings of the northern kingdom were not. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, and he also made molten images for the Baals. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of ben Hinnom, and burned his sons in fire, so there was a lot of child sacrifice um, during this time to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places on the hills and under every green tree. So, you know, they would go around and any time there was a little bit of a hill, they would say that was a place for a God and then they would make a little altar there. So God didn't want that. He wanted all the worship to be in... Jerusalem at the temple, so it could be controlled. And it wasn't just according to anybody's whim or fancy. It was according to his way. And so they were, he was breaking with this. And um, I wanted you to see what, what he had done that was so evil. And then if you look over at 16, at that time the king Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria for help, for the Edomites had come, and let's see. And the Philistines had also invaded the cities of the lowlands. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had brought about a lack of restraint in Judah and was very unfaithful to the Lord. So Tigpath Pelneser, king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. And although Ahaz took a portion out of the house of the Lord, and out of the palace of the kings and of the princes, and gave it to the king of Assyria, it did not help him. Now in the time of his distress, this same king Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord, so instead of turning to the Lord for help, he becomes more, he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, and said, because the gods of the kings of Assyria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they became the downfall of him in all Israel. Moreover, when Ahaz gathered together the utensils of the house of God, those are the gold utensils, and he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces, and he closed the doors of the house of the Lord and made altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem. So he was, he was very, very um, wicked. And he um, basically burned down the gold, you know, and he gave it to um, the Assyrians. And so then, his son, he had a good son, Hezekiah was his son, and his son, I, I had you all read this, he, and I won't read all of that, but in Second Chronicles 29, you can see how he restored the house of the Lord, and he rebuilt all that his father had tried to destroy. So, um, in the Old Testament, God was among his people, but at a distance from his people. And there was a clear door of separation. There was a door, there was a, the screen of the outer courtyard, there was the door to the inner tabernacle, there was a veil. There were three levels of um, 
separation. And remember the veil, which is what separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, that was what was rent from top to bottom when Jesus was crucified. And so what that means is now the priests, when they went into the holy place, because the veil was torn, they were also going into the most holy place. And in the epistles it tells us that we are now priests of God. It's called the priesthood of all believers. We are now priests, and as priests, we are given access through Jesus, only by coming in through him and his sacrifice. We have to come through all of those different steps. We come, and we can come into the presence of God because we are, rat, we are fitted for garment, his garments of righteousness. We are clothed with his garments of righteousness as we come in to the most holy place. So we are no longer kept out. You see, the purpose of the tabernacle was to keep people out because of the holiness of God. And now the doors have been thrown open. If we come through Jesus, there's one way to come. There's only one door. We come through that one door and we can come into the very presence of God. So, Miss Tommy, I thought that this was going to be just a small little study when I first started, and here we've spent the whole time on just the Old Testament. So we've got the New Testament to look forward to next week. But isn't it wonderful how what you think is some small thing, you get to researching it, and you find out that there's a whole lot of truth there. And what it does is it makes us so much, by studying all this, so much more aware Number one, of how other than us God is. That he is so holy and inapproachable for mankind. And yet through Jesus, we gain access to the Father through Jesus. So we realize that, that man in the Old Testament was kept away for his own preservation and yet, for the, just waiting for Jesus to come and fulfill all of that, which separates, so that we can now come in and fellowship. It's good news. It's good. That is the good Com news. Comments. I'm going to, whatever that was, it's good to, I'm going to unmute you. What symbolism does the pomegranate have? Because it was used in decorating as well. Well, first of all, it's red. It is indeed. It's red. And it has a blue zillion seeds on the inside, to be very technical about it. And look at what it does to your hands. Yes. And yes. It turns them red, too. Yeah. So, um, and I didn't go into all the, you know, the blue is like the heavens, and so it's uh, the presence of God. The red is for, and I, I guess... Um, God had in mind South Carolina because of the red clay, but over there, they, their soil is red. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to Petra, and the, it's called the Red Cliffs of Petra, and it, they're just, um, it's phenomenal. But man was made out of the, of the clay of the earth, and it's red, so it's for the humanity. And then, of course, the purple is the blending of, of the blue and the red. And, of course, it's a royal color. So um, the colors all have significance. I didn't get into all that, but I did concentrate on the beauty of it. Would red also um, signify blood? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it does. But it, they, they're thinking that that um, you know there, there's blood symbolism other places, but they're thinking that it really represents the the humanity of coming from the earth. The earth is red. That's what most of the scholars say. So. Right, but I'm a college and it said scarlet was man and blood and represented the son of man. That means that. Yeah. Well, we, can, and we, can, we come in through the blood of the Lamb, you know, the Lamb, Jesus. So that's why they chose the pomegranate to decorate it. Well, they didn't choose it, God chose oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the pomegranates were, and, and remember on the bottom of the priest's robe had little yeah. bells that right. line some people see this is not thing God thought of. See the people couldn't go in and see what was going on, but with the little bells on there they could hear what was going on. They would hear the tinkling of the bells. 
And then in between each bell was a pomegranate. I mean, not a real pomegranate, but a, a cotton pomegranate or something, you know, a, a, a pomegranate symbol uh, around the, um, so the bells wouldn't hit against each other, but it would just tinkle. And so they could, from outside, they could hear that. You know, God wanted them um, to have a glimpse. It was just a fleeting glimpse, but they had a glimpse by the beauty of that screen, by the by the the smelling of of the um, of the altar, of the smoke on the altar, the burning of the of the animals, um, and the tinkling of the bells once a year. Um, they had a glimpse of what was inside and what was going on. So. Okay, so next week we'll finish up this, and then the last week, y'all are going to have to do a little work. I'll write up some questions, but I want you to look back at the different uh, images that we've looked at and see what you see that's similar in the different ones or which ones seem more unique or whatever, and um, we'll talk about that. Would that be the Thursday before Easter? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, no, it's not going to be Easter week. It'll be the week before. I think. I don't know what day it is. I just go from one week to the next. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's pray as we as we end. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you feed our souls with with uh, your word, and that you strengthen us so that in our spirits we have life. We thank you for speaking to our hearts through these scriptures today. May we take the, the thoughts that we have thought and um, chew them up and, and really um, think on them this week, ponder upon these things, that they may, may blossom forth in our lives with lives of beauty and holiness unto you. So bless us, make us a blessing, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.